Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Gentlemen, you have a new member. Yeah. Uh, his last name is the same as the outgoing, but he wants to be called Jay instead of Joe. So, Joseph Johnson the fourth, you want to come up here yeah. and do your oath of office in front of your compadres. You raise your right hand, please. Do you swear or affirm that you will support the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the State of Michigan, the laws of the Charter Township of Grand Blanc to the best of your ability as you serve as a Planning Commission member? I do. Okay. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome to the regular Planning Commission meeting, Grand Blank Township, February 7, 2019. Please rise and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> We have a full planning commission this evening. We have Mr. Mansour, Mr. Saab, Ms. Coulter, our new member, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Brown, Mr. Jones, Mr. Bandersky, and Mr. Horsha, Mr. Yacho, our planner, Mr. Lloyd, and our attorney, Mr. David Laddie. One of the first things on our agenda is approval of this evening's agenda. Any changes? Chairman, I make a motion that we approve the agenda. Motion by Mr. Bandersky to approve the agenda as proposed. Support by Mr. Yancho. All those in favor, signal by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, motion passes 9-0. <clears throat> Next item on our agenda is approval of the minutes. Uh, we have two different months to do. First, we'll look at uh, minutes from the regular meeting of December 6th. 2018. Mr. Chairman, I have reviewed the final draft of the meeting minutes and found everything to be in order, and therefore I make a motion that we approve the minutes as listed. Any changes from anyone else? I have a motion, second that motion by Mr. Bandersky to approve the minutes of December 6, 2018, as presented. Support, Support by Mr. Saab. <coughs> All those in favor, signal by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, motion passes 9-0. Next is the meeting minutes of January 3rd, 2019. Mr. Chairman, I have reviewed the final draft of meeting minutes of January 3rd and found everything in order, and therefore I make a motion that we approve the minutes as listed. Any other, anyone else have any changes? Or? No. no. Motion by Mr. Bandersky to approve as presented, support, by Support. Mr. Brown. All those in favor, signal by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, motion passes 9-0. Next is an opportunity for public comment on anything that uh, we don't have a public hearing on, and we have no public hearings this evening. But I also don't see a lot of public in attendance. We will open up anyone who would like to speak. Seeing no one, we'll close that. Move on to the next item on our agenda is correspondence. We have two copies, not two copies, or two different planning and zoning news at our desk. Have anything else? Any correspondence. That brings us to old business, which is our new master plan. Yeah, we might want to move that away from old business. <laughs> oh, it don't sound right. Yeah. <laughs> So we have representatives from uh, Beckett and Rader here that's going to help us to uh, come up with an excellent uh, master plan. Right. Well, hi. This is super exciting for me. I'm really glad to be here. 
Um, thank you, first of all, for selecting us and offering us the opportunity to work with you on this exciting new master plan. I've had um, an excuse, opportunity... Excuse me one minute. Would you please state your name and Oh, yep, address. absolutely. My name and address? Like my home address? Absolutely. No. My name is Leah Dumichel. I am um, representing the firm of Beckett and Rader um, at 535 West William Street in Ann Arbor. And I'm here this evening to introduce the master plan process and to um, have a little conversation with you about it. So Mark and I have been corresponding and I know that he has presented to you um, some questions about desired development within Grand Blanc Township. So first I'd like to give a little overview of myself, of the firm, of the plan process. Um, and then I thought maybe there would be a couple of discussions that we could have um, briefly about what you'd like to uh, understand from the community engagement portion, what we'd like to know from your community, and then to talk about those development examples. So I'll just get right into it. Um, as I said, my name is Leah Dumichel. I will be the project lead for this project. It will be, there will be many people helping me on my team, but um, you will, I will be your primary contact and I'll be the one who pulls this together. There's a little bobcat by my picture because I am in fact from around here and am quite from around here. Um, so I grew up in a little neighborhood behind the old Grand Blank and you guys really should have kept that going in my absence. I'm very disappointed that it's no longer there. <laughs> but so I, um, it, that's where I was born. That's where I, Grand, Grand Blank High School graduate, class of 95. And so this master plan process is, is very important to me. I mean, my family is still here. The future of this community remains um, deeply intertwined with mine. I have with me Marissa Laderach. She is the GIS specialist at our firm and she will, she's here, um, well, she came with me to talk primarily with their GIS department, which is a really tremendous thing that you have here that not many communities of your size do. And so we think that our ability to um, work with them on the spatial components of a master plan, which is pretty much all of them, will just be a, a tremendous asset to this project moving forward. So we came and chatted with the department earlier. Later on, we'll have a little opportunity for Marissa to talk a little bit about some preliminary findings that we've done here. The two on the bottom, on the left, is John Eichelangeli. He is the partner in charge, the planning partner at our firm, and he um, has attended already a meeting. He's, he will be you know, kind of working with us, offering guidance as needed. And then Michelle Bennett is the remaining member of our planning team who is really um, instrumental in keeping us going in all of our projects. I'm sure this one will be no exception. But all, most of your communications will be directly with me, unless it's mapping related, and then probably with Marissa. Just very briefly, a couple of words um, about our firm. We've been around since 1966, and John Beckett still comes to work, so it must be a pretty great place to work. Uh, we are a thoroughly integrated, interdisciplinary firm with the services of landscape architecture, planning, engineering, and environmental services. So we really work hard to get the most out of all of those disciplines in each of our projects, whichever is the lead. We're an implementation focused firm. I think that one of our real advantages as planners is working so closely with landscape architects. So sometimes planners can think a thing is implemented if the plan is adopted. We're not granted such luxury. In our firm, it's implemented if it's built. And that means that you have gotten all the way through the process. We, um, we are an award-winning firm and I have a couple of slides on those. Our main goals are to exceed your expectations and to be responsive. Our Whole slogan is a little bit longer than that, but those are the ones that we absolutely lead with. I do want to just tell you briefly um, that we have won more awards for master plans than any other firm in the state, and the only reason that I want to tell you that is because I would just like to emphasize how seriously we take that particular task. It is our goal to craft everyone to truly move a community forward and to meet your needs, and I am very excited about the chance to do that here. We don't just do master plans. Um, we have that thoroughly integrated set of services allows us to not just help you plan, but if you like, also help you implement it. So we like to say that from idea to ribbon cutting, we can help you through it and we're glad to. So now on to what we're doing here. Um, this is the basic overview of the basic sections that your master plan will have in it. And we will start with initiation and organization, really getting our process down so that we have the right tools and people in place to have a successful project. And then 
the first thing that we will really begin to um, roll up our sleeves and start working on are people and priorities. So that is community engagement, which is grounded in a real understanding of who the folks in our community are. Land and systems, that's sort of the interaction between our built and natural systems. There's still plenty of natural system remaining here in Grand Blanc Township, and we'd like to preserve the best of it and to be as intelligent as possible for the ways in which the landscape can not only be, but also continue to work for us. Centers, corridors, and neighborhoods, that is where the pieces of the built system fit together and the ways in which we can enhance them all. And circulation, that is how people, ideas, freight, things, how everything moves through the community. It's sometimes called transportation, but a broader view of it takes um, into account the fact that more things move than just cars on roads. And finally, integration and implementation. Our goal is to present you with a fully realized, um, while there are a lot of moving parts, a fully integrated document where all the parts move together in a cohesive, way that we can all kind of put our shoulders to the same wheel. So that's kind of the biggest overview. I'm going to um, spend a little bit of time talking about the people and priorities section. Um, and that, you know, is more commonly, it includes the community engagement portion. But again, as I said, it's really kind of grounded in the understanding of who the people are. So this little chart that I have here, um, shows the process that we had proposed in our initial um, uh, re response, to, uh, response to your request for proposals. And when we do this, there's always a little bit of, this is, I, you know, I write these proposals often and I feel like it's maybe the hardest thing to do is to understand exactly what will be the most effective kind of communication with any given community citizens without having met you, without knowing you, without having you know a good understanding of who the folks are and what your systems are and what you've already done, that's rough. So we try to do the best we can and then adjust with you and work with you to make that the best fit possible. So this is what was um, in the scope of work. First, the demographic review where we understand both the characteristics of the population and how they're distributed. Where are the populations different throughout the community? A township is generally much bigger than a city. There's a lot more geography to consider. There's a lot more room for you know areas that are more similar to themselves and more different from other areas. So once we had that understanding, we had proposed an internet-based community survey. So a good survey that can either be distributed on SurveyMonkey or we have the capability <coughs> to design a one that has uh, more of a rooting in spatial understanding, so perhaps we are asking people to go to places and tell us what they think about certain places. We would distribute that through your regular channels and sort of that would be a self-selective process. The folks, you know, as many people as we can convince to answer this survey, well. And then we always ask for demographic information to understand who we've heard from in the community. When we have those results and when we understand who we heard from at that kind of first blush, and we compare it to who we know is in the community, we'll understand where the gaps are. Who didn't we hear from? Who were those methods not successful to reach? And then we can design individual strategies to get to those people, and that's the second arrow, where we would look for the demographic and geographic areas that we didn't hear from. And um, because we do understand that this thing goes the absolute best when the folks who are running the community are really the ones who are engaging with it because here's the absolute truth of the matter is that I don't live here anymore I am a consultant folks do not want a great relationship with me as a leader of their community they want it with you as the leader of their community so it is our job to facilitate that relationship to give you all of the rules possible but the best outcome is when you and your community have a better relationship than when we started this so in our view one way to do that is to figure out the best way to for us to go to the folks that we have not yet heard from and give them easier, more convenient, and better fitting ways to give us input. So there's one method. Now I'm going to turn it over to Marissa for just a second to show you a little bit of how oh, whoops, too far, of how we started to break down what that might look like. Right, so um, what we did... Excuse me, please state your name yes. and address. Of course, Marissa Latterack. I'm a planner at Beckett and Rader, and our address is 535 West William Street, Ann Arbor, Michigan. 
Um, and what I'm here to talk about right now is a little bit of preliminary mapping that we did. So when we were taking a look at this RFP and kind of crafting what our strategy needed to be, uh, we understood that one of the tools we need to harness is GIS and that we use this throughout the entire plan, throughout the entire process. But one of the strongest times that we can use it is when we're doing community engagement and we're trying to figure out who we have not heard from. So what's important for us is not just a quantity of responses, but a quality and making sure that we're hearing from everybody, from all walks of life, from all the different demographic groups. Um, and part of how we can figure that out is by looking at proprietary GIS software that we have access to that we bring to the table. Um, and a couple of these preliminary maps that I had done looked at um, consumer behaviors, consumer profiles, consumer spending habits. Um, and we can see a couple of them are based on how old people are, uh, what their household income is. Uh, access to internet is a big thing too. When we think about community surveys, we wanna make sure that if we don't hear from a big group of population, where are they? Are they potentially living in an area where we don't see strong access to internet? Are they in an area that might be a lower income community and therefore, again, access to internet would be a little bit more difficult or challenging? Uh, we look at age because that plays into how many people are more willing to take online surveys, those types of things. Um, all of this breaks down into the fact that we have a lot of tools in this toolkit and we make sure that we use all of them so we make sure we're hearing from all of the people we possibly can. So these are a couple of maps that we made before. You might have seen them. Um, we had a couple that we left here after our interview. Uh, but the idea is that we're just trying to make sure that we're getting all of the information we possibly can from all of the people we can possibly hear from. Uh, so this is just another one of the tools that we like to use. And then I'll turn it back over to Leah. <laughs> so that's what we thought before we got here. And then um, I believe it was even before the interview, we were asked to consider what it might be like to uh, have to take a more statistically a more statistical approach to the surveying. So the kind of self-selected outreach method is one. And then another method is wherein we take the entire sample frame of the community and perhaps we um, what is the word I, this, we achieve a statistically significant frame and then we would mail them to um, each of those households. We would determine how many responses that we need to get, where they need to come from, that whole statistic process to ensure that we've received random representation from all across the community. Once we have that, that is a rich data set that um, you really don't have to supplement in various, uh, on the basis of geography or demography or any of those things. If you've taken the scientific approach, you have sort of achieved that uniform coverage. What you have not done, though, with that approach is given the folks an opportunity to really interact with the folks who are then going to be carrying that plan forward. I believe with um, all of my heart training and everything else that all community engagement has to do two things and it has to do both of those things. The first is it has to provide good data for the project. We have to ask about things that we intend to use that input on and only those things. We have to do it in a way that really values the input that we've been given. And the second thing is we need to provide a good experience for the participant. It is I feel our job to, if we are going to solicit that input and again ask folks to give us their time, their attention, their thought, their intelligence, to at least offer them a valuable experience in return. So the more engaging, the more educational, the more, dare I say, fun it can be made, the better off everybody is. And I really think that it, listen, planning can be perfectly dry and I'm well aware of that. But people are really interested in what's going on where they live. Like the ability to participate is not something that I think even occurs to everyone as something that could happen. And folks are really excited when they get to. So we have a variety of other methods in addition to the survey, which can provide that kind of qualitative aspect to the experience. So one of them that, I, that was suggested to us was the idea of a meeting in a box. And so um, <clears throat> we have actually uh, several master plans starting up at the same time, and we really we are really community engagement focused. Our, we take this very seriously. And so we sat down and started to talk about, well, what would a really good meeting in a box look like? How could we design that so that we really achieve those two things that we, that we think are so important? And um, what we came up with was kind of more of a series of games 
than it was, you know, kind of a dry survey, all of them very planning focused. By the time we were done, we were having such a good time that we were pretty sure we could call it a planning party in a box and sort of deputize folks to get together with their own neighbors and discuss the way that things should be in their community according to them, because that's what we want to know. Whatever this option is, whatever, however we design the community engagement strategy, and I think I'm gonna to skip to the next slide really quickly, we have a whole menu of those things. So the, the two kind of routes that I just showed you are two that you know we have thought of in relation to Grambling Township. But the first thing that I think it will be really important to do as we get down to work is to really design that strategy, to understand who we want to talk to, who we need to hear from, what we need to learn from them, and what the most successful methods have been in the past, to use all of those things to craft what is really the right strategy to hear what we need to here in Grand Plain Township. So here are a couple of other options that could make up that strategy. When it's all said and done and we have concluded our, um, our, our heaviest community engagement, it should go on throughout the process, but the really the taking in information phase is heaviest in the beginning. Then we can review and reflect. So we will compile them all into a summary, summary of findings. We will bring together um, the municipal leadership. At a minimum, that should include the Planning Commission and the Township Board, but I can easily imagine that there might be many other folks that should be involved in this meeting where we will review the summary of findings and really use it to craft the goals and strategies of the plan. Toward the end, we believe that it is just tremendously valuable to hold a public open house as we are finalizing the drafts so that folks can see what we've been doing, so that they can provide feedback, so that it's an opportunity to close the loop before we get to the public hearing. Because all we want to hear at the public hearing is what a great job it was, how accurately we reflected everybody's concerns, and how excited everybody is to move forward. So that's our community engagement strategy. And I wonder if we could take just a second um, to ask, I would like to ask each of you, if you don't mind, what you would most like to know through that process. Like when we're done talking to citizens, what would you like to have kind of a good idea of that you don't right now? Questions in advance. No. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> we can save it for next meeting if that would be better. <laughs> so, so I can just uh, start off here. Uh, because I was going to make a comment about this anyway. So one of the things that uh, I think was a, a very interesting part of the presentation you made was the whole uh, student, uh, it was on the prior page, but anyway, uh, the interaction with the students. And I think that the student family input is particularly important because we really have to focus on creating an environment in the township here that's conducive to retaining these uh, young people. As it stands right now, uh, basically we, we educate uh, kids. We spend a lot of time and energy doing that. Um, uh, the, the numbers say that our, our school system is pretty good, mm -hmm. uh, and yet as we look ahead, um, you know, we don't see uh, the um, job opportunities uh, available in the township to retain to retain those students in the in the in, in the uh, community here. So as we look ahead to understand, you know, kind of what those needs are to make sure that we can uh, provide a longer term. Um, opportunity for, for the people to come and stay and grow in the neighborhood. Yeah, I've got a follow-up question to that. Okay, you graduated from Grand Blanc High School. I did. In, in 1995. I did. Why did you leave? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and this is, this is just the absolute truth. Uh, when I was 14, my mother was accepted to the University of Michigan to finish her engineering degree. And so we moved to Ann Arbor, where I lived from the age of 14 until just before I turned 17. I fell madly in love. And with the city, I mean, there was a boy too, but it was much with the city. <laughs> <laughs> and um, by the time my time there was up, I was just not, I was too sort of maybe addicted is the right word to the density and the excitement and the liveliness. And I was absolutely coming back. So, and I, you know, I think that that will be a case for a certain amount of kids everywhere, but we want them to come back, right? So even if, you, even if you feel that way at 18, as I did, how can they come back when it's time? Mr. Yancho? As a second follow-up to the student question, yeah. is there a way to reach out to previous students who are still students at universities and colleges around the country to find out 
what their thoughts are about what would bring them back or keep them here after they graduate from university? Hmm, that would be a good question. So I can just off the top of my head think of um, two places I would check first. I would ask if the school maintains any kind of alumni. I would be surprised. That seems like a pretty heavy data lift for them. But the second route might be to see if we can get the enrollment addresses for a few years ago and send it to their parents' house, which you won't catch everybody, but you would think that there will be a pretty significant number. Thank you. Sure. Sorry, I'm not calling it up, but it's a chair uh, job. <laughs> so yeah, so, so the surveys will help because people will tell you exactly what they want. But I'm wondering how successful you've been, especially with the GIS stuff, determining, you know, based on the demographics, the type of people that are living there, the age groups and all that, what sort of gaps in the market are missing that they don't even really know about? Like, so perhaps, and I always think about all the big industry, you know, down 75 that are in Auburn Hills, and how can we get some more of those? you know, big, you know, huge factories and warehouses and all those, you know, big gorgeous buildings up on 75. We got a lot of land up there. You know, maybe we do have the right workforce and, and all that for these people and they, don't, and they don't know about it and we don't even know what to be attracting them. So is that the type of stuff you could find? Missing opportunities? Hmm. So they would be missing in the sense we that... We don't even know we want them, but you have the data where we've got enough land and we've got these particular resources, so we should focus on attracting this particular type of thing, even though we haven't asked you that we want this particular type of thing. Sure. Well, I mean, you know, sometimes that presents itself in the process. I will say that it is extremely difficult to find something, to lo find out where a hole is precisely. So I think the strategy would be to start with understanding what is missing and then understanding the challenges and that's when you would see okay the answer to the next question is what would fill that gap mm -hmm. so i think not in a straightforward way but hopefully this process should uncover it could that piece also maybe fit more into the implementation once you identified some of those yes i think so i mean but the challenge, I mean, the thing that I think that I'm hearing you speak to is sort of recruiting specific industries and um, maybe specific businesses. Yeah, I mean, that was an, an example. But more generally, I'm curious if your type of studies can identify stuff that even we don't say we want. You know, so a bunch of, sure. a bunch of surveyors might say, I want more grocery stores, and you might be very good at going out to find the more grocery stores to come and where to put them. Right. But what's the stuff we're not asking for that you know, based on our community type, that we would benefit from? Yeah. And if I could just add to that. Uh, so some things that we do actually look at, you know, when we're trying to figure out who we're missing as far as demographics go, a lot of times we know for a fact that we don't always hear from people with young families. We don't always hear from kids. So we do try to target input from them. But you're asking about the other side of it too. We're not just looking for their input, but what are the things that we don't realize where we're losing, say, money or businesses? And we do have information that looks at spending patterns and spending habits, and we can see when people aren't spending enough money at grocery stores here and they're going to grocery stores outside of the townships or restaurants or certain types of businesses or industries. So we actually can hit on both of those. It just depends on which side of the angle that we're trying to come at here. But yes, I think you're right. We can do that. And this is something that we can address in implementation too. If we see that there's a huge gap in one particular type of market, we can try and target to bring that in. So yes, you're right. We can do those things. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Coulter? Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on with comments on how we encourage young people to either stay in the community or, you know, after they graduated from college or graduate school or whatever, to come back to the community. And, I mean, obviously, the, what will attract them to come back to the community or stay here is if there are good jobs here. So I think, you know, I'd like to see the master plan also focus on how we attract employers and particularly employers that are, you know, offering a highly skilled, high paying jobs. Um, I think we've got a great base with the, um, you know, Ascension Genesis Health Center there. I mean, those are obviously, you know, well-paying and highly skilled jobs. And healthcare is one industry that's not only seems to be always increasing and booming, but it's kind of doesn't um, suffer from the ups and downs of the economy like a lot of other industries do. Um, but, um, and, you know, I'm sure they're, they're but basically, I think, you know, obviously the master plan should kind of look at how we, what kind of jobs we want to attract and some, you know, steps on how we're going to go about doing that. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I will say that in the past probably two years, I have heard much less often, but it seemed like I went to bed one night and everybody was saying, where are the jobs? Where are the jobs? And I woke up the next morning and everybody was saying, where are the workers? Where are the workers? <laughs> so that is actually what we are hearing much more often than um, a concern with not having the right jobs. And in that case, um, the whole you know state of Michigan, starting under Governor Snyder back in 2012-ish, I will say, um, has really kind of invested its time and energy and money into the idea of placemaking, which is you know kind of like you know business needs talent, talent wants place, place needs business. It's that circle of it, and instead of focusing entirely on the business retention focusing on the talent retention. And that may be, it, you know, if we survey your business community and get a better understanding of what their needs are, we may find that there are plenty of jobs, but we need our workers and we need to figure out how to attract them. I'm not sure, but I'd be interested to find out. I think that Grand Blank has been traditionally known as a bedroom community and we're interested in making a transition right. from that, I guess. Is yeah, because I mean, I say, if you're not gonna attract young people unless you have jobs for them. I mean, they're not going to just, I mean, I agree. We've got, you know, a good community in the sense of our neighborhoods. And, yeah, but, sure. No, it doesn't, <laughs> they've got to have some job Oh, yeah, I mean, everybody needs a job. That's Absolutely. not going away. For sure. For Yeah, one of the job opportunities, although there isn't usually a great turnover, is uh, education. Mm -hmm. And we have Kettering, we have UM Flint, yeah. We have Mott. We used to have Baker, but now they're moving. Yeah. But uh, from the standpoint of a bedroom community, working in any of those places and then coming here to live would be an ideal situation if, the, if somebody's interested in right. pursuing an educational a work area. Absolutely. And another comment would be, in a survey, in your survey, yeah. uh, asking people where do they go to shop, yes, eat, that's one of my favorite. entertain, etc., because they go to those places because they're not here. Yep. In in a general sense, I mean, there, there's other venues that we can't afford or wouldn't bring here, but again, right. simple things. Uh, you got Costco, people go to Costco and, uh, and other places like that. That uh, you know, Auburn Hills is a great place, to, Rochester Hills is a great place to go eat. You know, they have a lot of nice uh, areas, right. nice eateries as compared to we have one or two. And that's about it. And then, then a bunch of uh, uh, fast Chains. food places. Sure. But why are they not doing those things here, I think, is an important question. Yeah. Mr. Johnson? Do you guys find that um, the, the, the businesses within the community can offer any valuable data? Offer any so, valuable data. Valuable data as far as, you know, questioning them on what type of employee they need, what type of job that they're trying to fill that they can't? Yes, um, absolutely. And is that part of the, the survey? I'm new, um, so. It certainly can be. It's usually a separate survey just because uh, business owners, like their interests are sort of markedly different. And we want to ask them some, in addition, some technical questions about, you know, how the zoning process impacts their ability. I mean, just things that are going to make the regular citizen's eyes glaze over but are very important to the business community. So it would usually be a separate one, but we find that to be tremendously valuable. And especially if there is, you know, um, a, a DDA or a member of the uh, board or just someone who's kind of really dialed into the business community here and has like personal contacts, the response rate <coughs> goes way up there. But yes, that is, I mean, they're, they're a cornerstone of the community, so we have to accommodate and assist them. Thank you. Sure. No, I'm just intently listening. <laughs> <laughs> If I may, then uh, I'm sitting here thinking about, uh, you know, we would love to have millennials here in the community mm -hmm. to spend here, live here, all of that sort of stuff, and we have to have the hook to get them here, that's for sure. And I was thinking about the hot spots in 
the metro Detroit area, and it started out in Royal Oak. Mm -hmm. All of the millennials were there, and then they're elsewhere. Now I hear the new hotspot is Ferndale. Mm -hmm. So the problem I see in that is that it's the herd mentality. They, they're not happy where they are, they've, whatever they've got here, with something new, and they move on. My concern is if we don't even really have we, the old adage about build it and they will come, but I'm not sure they're going to stay. They may come to visit, so to speak. And we've, got to, we've got to do a lot more in understanding what they really want to see and do and why they want to live here. Yeah. I guess my, my question to that would be, are we sure we want millennials? And that, like my just, so if you're not sure that we <laughs> that have any. My, my question was <laughs> 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 not quite how I meant it. <laughs> but, Eventually, we're probably going to have to go that way. <laughs> we saw but following what you just said, so if we would have to go through a great effort to attract them is what I'm saying. If it doesn't look like it's a natural fit to start with, then I would want to know more about what the natural fit is. You know what I'm like, is this a flash in the pan or we're really, you know, master planning is a big, long term, earth moving endeavor. Flash in the pan is not going to do it. At the same time, we are talking about the biggest, biggest generation in America. so not really flash in the pan, finding what the right match is, I think will be, will be the key. I guess going back to your original question, I guess I'd like to know why do people live here mm -hmm. and what would make them want to stay? Pretty basic, I like it. But that gets right down to it. But in some cases they may, may not even know what it is, so I'm presuming on a survey you're going to have different items that mm -hmm. And also an open section, I'm guessing, as well. Yep. Actually, that's just raised a question in my mind. Maybe a good question in the survey is, why did you move to Grand Blanc? Or, yes. you know, how long, you, where did you live before? Why did you move here? Yeah. You know, oh, where did you live before? Now, that's a new one. would be a big oh, wow. part of it, but, you know. Mr. Yacho? So you mentioned that you might reach out to uh, former students from the high school to yes. see where they're at going back a few years. But why not go back further and see where those expats from Grand Blank are, whether they're in other So Michigan now you're telling cities. me to mind my Facebook feed, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and where, you know, throughout the country or the world, why did these, why did uh, former residents of Grand Blank who spent their youth here, uh, why did they choose to move away? Well, that would be really Because good. that's the opposite side of the coin, and maybe that's the thing that we really need to ask more than what would make you stay, but why did you leave? You know, I could not agree more because there will be a subset of those answers that are just, there are a lot of places on this earth, and if what you wanted was something that we don't have, then chasing it is maybe, to satisfy people who are not coming back is maybe not the best. I totally, really appreciate that perspective. Cool. There will be plenty of time to talk about this. We'll be going over this survey in great detail, so we certainly don't have to get all the work done tonight. I very much appreciate this, like, kind of starter of it. So it will, it will pay dividends moving on. I wanted to um, just, I have three slides um, about the basic community framework, beginning, entry, things that we will probably be thinking about in the social, economic, and physical dimensions as we move through the master plan. So starting with the social, um, you know, between 2000 and 2010, Michigan was the only state in the nation that lost population. Grand Blanc Township did not participate in that trend. Awesome. Um, growing by a significant percentage during that decade, proving that even during Michigan's lost decade, this was a good place to be. I mean, as bad as it has been in Michigan, it was still good here. I think that, that everybody here deserves a round of applause and a pat on the back for the circumstances that made that happen. Households have increased by about 3,000, which means that housing must have increased in some way, or we have really utilized some unutilized housing before. That, if it's going to continue, and it's projected to continue, maybe not as strongly, but somewhat, um, will be something that we should think about in the master plan. What kinds of housing do we offer? If there are segments of the population that we are trying to attract, and we are attracting people in general, how can we customize our housing options to facilitate that match would be things that we've been thinking about. The media... Oh. 
don't want to throw water on your survey or on my census. <laughs> your, but my personal experience would say that you can use the 2000 number, but the 2010 number isn't relevant. That number needs to be 15 or 16. Yes, your and so that is going to change dramatically. Sure. Um, I did look at the American Community Survey numbers for 2017. I chose to do the decennial census because that's a full census. They count every single person. They rely on sampling for the American Community Survey numbers. It's a five-year sampling frame, so that would have they would have been looking at an average over 2012 to 2017. But the number was pretty similar. If I, if it had been vastly different, I would have included it. I think they said that it was. They actually said it was 36,000 something. So I just thought, well, we'll stick with the full census. Well, households. Units built, mm -hmm. for example, if you look at what was built in 2000 around here in this township, mm -hmm. and then you go and look at what was built in 2000, the number of units produced in 2016, say, mm -hmm. the number is mind bogglingly shrunk. Yeah. Really? Well, mm -hmm. sure. There's a housing boom going on. You got a pace where we were building houses at a quite a breakneck breakneck speed for a while there until the recession hit. Yeah, but that that's true, but we were still selling them. And we stopped selling them about 2008, 2007. That's what happened. A lot of other things were going on during that period too. There's been a lot of global things that have happened where people aren't buying houses. But it's still household we're talking about here. And we do, um, do we do compare these numbers. Uh, so, you know, I, I just kind of touched on the difference between the American Community Survey data and the um, decennial census data. So we try to ground truth those numbers with building permit data, for example, and see how well, see how well those lines up, those line up to provide the most accurate picture possible. Of course, the only way to get the proper numbers is for us ourselves to go out and count every single house out there, and that is probably not within the scope of this project. <laughs> so, um, population up, households up, median age up slightly, which is true. Did you have a question? Well, I'm just setting your thinking. Well, I mean, I think, unless I'm just like the fish story gets larger every time you tell it, but it seems to me back in, you know, in 2000 in that area, we were having 800 plus single family unit permits being pulled, if my memory serves me correctly. Right, that's an accurate right number. Okay, I Chairman, uh, it's higher right than that. Actually higher than I mean, like for two, three, four years in a row, they were just. This is for a while doing, there, yeah. Yeah, that it was just going crazy. And then it just flat stopped. If you look well, at that seems like it would add up to about 3,000, right? If you had 800 a year for three or four years in a row, now we're up to 2,400, and then, you know, kind of a gradual or even the flat line, you know, that seems like we're getting pretty close to a 3,000 household increase. And again, these are just two census numbers. I will feel much more confident about them after I've had really some more time to dig into them. Do we all, is it? ground truth among us here that the population has increased between 2000 and 2010, so at least we're on solid ground there? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. okay. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Porsche has got a house he wants to sell. That's well, if I mean, I, 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 I sell if a lot I mean, of houses, yeah. but the problem is actually being able to do it. Yes. If I may, Mr. Chairman, right now we've got a, a development that's over on uh, Grand Blank Road. <laughs> it took, I, I can't even begin to, uh, uh, think how long it took for the Genesee County Road Commission to approve yeah. that area. It's under construction now. They're going like crazy. And if I, again, please correct me if I'm wrong, when the developer is out of Ohio, they decided they wanted to be here, and they saw this as a market for a number of different kinds of uh, uh, folks. Um, retirees, mm -hmm. they believe, that do not want to own a home any longer. Mm -hmm. They're not interested in buying a condo or anything like that. They would rather rent mm -hmm. and 
basically rent on a monthly basis and pick up and leave if they want. This co uh, this uh, company, I can't come up with the name of it now, right now. Can you guys? You got Banbury? Well, that's the name that's of it, the but I'll come up with the Redway? Redway. 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 Thank you, Redway, no. yes. As many times as they were here. And so we've got something going over there where it's going to be uh, a lot of units. Unless I'm dead wrong, they're all going to be rented. And I'm going, you know, I don't know how transient this is going to be. Well, I think none of us knows that. So that's our next statistic is the percentage of homeowners um, between 2000 and 2010 dropped from 74% to 69%. This should be no surprise in a decade that hosted a foreclosure crisis, right? I mean, this really, no surprise there. Um, and it, it's my opinion, and I haven't seen anything in any data to contradict it, that we don't actually know what the fallout from that foreclosure crisis is going to be on the long-term opinions of people about how they want to invest their life savings, which is basically what purchasing a home is. I'm not sure that the desire for home ownership is going to fully rebound among either elderly people or younger folks. I just, I'm not sure. Well, that was my question. Does the data show that more people, whether I keep saying millennials or seniors as well, is the trend that way where they really don't want to own a joint? They just simply want to live there and if they want to leave, they can leave. If you want to be more mobile, if you have a house, you're kind of stuck. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Right. <clears throat> and I don't know that people are sure that it's the good bargain that it once seemed to be, you know? You mean owning? Yes. Okay. But at the same time, the reserve of Grand Blank on Baldwin Road is building as fast as they can turn them out, and those people are purchasing those units. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's 69% is still well over the majority. Oh, it's yeah. a drop, and it, you know, for those of us who really kind of um, think that home ownership is in some ways a proxy for community health, that kind of drop is alarming. I'm not sure that it necessarily is a proxy for community health. I think that it presents different challenges. Um, but to an extent, there's not much that we can do about it in any case. So if what is happening is that our communities are going to have more rentership, then figuring it out successfully, I think, should be our goal. Does your data show that? I mean, from a nationwide perspective? Or oh, a let's Midwest see. perspective or anything like that? I, I believe so. I would have to double check the national numbers. So, because I'm usually looking at the community level. Um, in all the communities I've been in recently, yes, there, there is a drop. Um, households with children um, has actually increased by one-tenth of a percentage point. That's no small feat, actually. That does not happen in all communities. Overall, the trend in communities throughout Michigan, and entirely throughout the country, but I'm more familiar with Michigan and it's more pronounced in Michigan, is that median ages are rising all over, particularly in communities that have low immigration rates, and those immigration rates could be like from abroad or from other communities. But the in, the in-place communities here in Michigan are aging. And that has implications for the way that we build them. So for us to be achieving even a tenth of a percentage point gain in households with children, I think, I mean, just frankly speaks to the strength of the school system here, in addition to like the general quality of life. But, you know, I've been here for a long time and Grand Lake schools have been legendary for that whole time. So for, for that to be keeping up, good job, folks. But on the other side of the spectrum, the percentage of households which are um, which house one person who's age 65 or older has increased quite a bit over the course of that 10 years from about 700 households 6% of the community to almost 1200 households 8% of the community and I think that we can expect that to continue also and that's good for us to know for two reasons one so that we can serve these folks better while they're here but two um, we know that there is a turnover coming in where those homes are. So if you have a neighborhood, for example, that is largely characterized by households of this time, of this type, you can guess that in, by the end of this master plan in 25 years, there will be different people living in those houses and they, it will have a slightly different character. So good for us to plan for and to keep in mind.
I also have a pie chart of our new residents. Um, Grand Lake Township is diversifying, which mm -hmm. is just really terrific. Uh, of those uh, 7,000 or so new residents that we got between 2000 and 2010, the majority of them were white, but a significant African American population, a few American Indian, some Asian, and about as many two or more races. The community framework in terms of economics. Um, the Tech Village is fairly recently in place. It is fully zoned. It is fully ready to go. That should be a major driver in Grand Lakes economy for the coming decade or so at least. We have the major corridors, Hill, Saginaw, Dort, Holly, and Baldwin, all of which, with the exception of Dort Highway, have been the focus of some planning effort beforehand. So we would want to carry forward those efforts where where they are still relevant and good, and we would want to improve upon them where we can. Um, but those are, yes? Thinking about roads for a moment, what impact do you see, uh, does your firm see in the uh, North Highway extension that's going to begin doing a little bit here, I think in April or May of this year? Yeah. What impact do you see that having on that portion of our township? You know, it's really interesting. I would anticipate it to be pretty significant because it feeds right into that new DDA district, into places where things are kind of already happening. And so I would expect it to be um, to be a real driver of that, to really just increase access and to increase the appeal of that area to places, um, to, I'm sorry, ventures and establishments to whom that access is important. But I will say, that, um, so since I'm from around here, I remember the first Dort Highway extension and I have recently thought to myself, boy, I thought there would be more out here all these years after that extension. So I'm not sure that I would bet the whole farm on it, but I do think that the circumstances are different um, given that the DDA is adapted and that there is already like a significant nucleus of activity there. I think it would just feed it. So. I, I mean, I, I think that that's a, an excellent point because uh, uh, improving access to the area via a highway uh, really makes it easier for people outside of the community to come in, right. you work, and then leave. Exactly. So, I mean, there's going to be people who want to live close. There always are, but it's right. not like a 100% gain kind of thing. Right. Yeah. But I would say that along with that... <laughs> Along with that, we should also make sure that they have like the right convenience um, retail sure. so that they can stop and get what they need before they get out of town. Absolutely. Um, because those are corridors and the township, as many townships are, are defined in a significant portion by its corridors, we would want to be thinking about where nodes are, where are the right places to intensify activity along those corridors. And um, redevelopment ready community site packages. I if. You may be considering, you may have started in on the Redevelopment Ready Communities program, whether or not you have, they really sort of provide a format um, for packaging sites that are ripe and desired for redevelopment. And any of that that we are interested in exploring here, we think that that is just really a delightful addition to a master plan if um, some particular areas are studied in some detail to make it easier for anyone who would like to do what we would like them to do on those properties. And finally, the physical framework. Um, the township remains somewhat rural. There are still ample uh, green space and green assets here in the township. And I think that it is tremendously important to understand those green assets, how they can best be leveraged. I mean, as Nature can perform some of the functions that infrastructure does and can perform them better. It can perform functions that our infrastructure does not currently perform, such as cleaning the air and sometimes cleaning what I mean. There are ways in which we can live better with our natural environment than we currently are at a loss to no one and in fact a gain to all. And before we have fully paved over the entire township in the name of economic development, I would like to understand what the best balance of that is so that we can you can use that as you make decisions going forward. There's a vast enthusiasm all over this state right now, everywhere I go, for uh, trails and non-motorized amenities. As a matter of fact, we had dinner with my dad right beforehand. He lived in Grand Lane Township, now in Fenton Township. We just finished a Fenton Township master plan. He was like, oh, you're doing another one of those? Where's my trails in Fenton Township? Now, mind you, we just passed this thing like two months ago, but where's my trails, he says. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I think he's not alone. I, I'm hearing it all over. The Iron Bell Trail has a route that is scheduled to come through the township, leveraging that for economic development, connecting it to our nodes, ensuring that we um, have provided the folks who want to use that asset with everything that they could possibly want, will do nothing but benefit us and them. Site and development matchmaking is again kind of like that uh, redevelopment communities um, site package, a real understanding of where we can best serve our community, by our business community by directing them. And finally, utility assessment for desired de development. Just one of those nuts and bolts things that, you know, a plan should do is to understand if we can accommodate everything that we want to and if we can't now how we should get there. So those are kind of the things that I see us looking at in some more detail as we chug through this plan. And then finally, um, the last thing that I'll say kind of about the planning process is about implementation. The first thing, one first thing that I would like to do is to assess that 2013 action plan, which had an awful lot of things in it, just to see what is still, what have you completed, first of all, what can we check off and have a great big party about? And second of all, what is still relevant? There may be things that circumstances have changed and that's not even a thing anymore. There may be things that we, we don't even need to talk about again. We just know that we still need to do that and put it on the list. When we write plans, they are, to the best of, absolute best of my ability, accessible, engaging, and useful. Um, this is actually my second career. My first was in journalism um, and publishing more broadly. So a beautiful, well-written document is something that is like really important to me, not just for its own sake, which it is, but because I truly understand that who is ever going to pick up the plan and use it if you fall asleep by the time you are done reading the table of contents. So we do our absolute best to, I mean, some bits are dry, there's nothing you can do about that. I did just talk about a utility assessment, but to the extent that we can, we try to make the plan a living, usable document. Some ways in which we can kind of help with that are to break off some digestible chunks. So an executive summary that's brief and suitable for widespread distribution. Why should we be the only ones who get to know what's in the master plan? Let's tell everybody in an amount of detail that can be tolerated by the average folk who are not so excited by this. I don't know about them. And finally, the 2019 action plan. Ideally, so all of our action plans are implementation focused as much as we can get them. Projects, timeframes, responsibilities, partners, all those <coughs> things are in your standard action plan. What would be really great is if we could break it up by department and make sure that everybody who lives, works, well not lives, but everybody who works here understands what their portion of the master plan is, how it touches them and the things that may, that they may be called upon to participate in as we move forward with the plan. So then the next things um, that we'll be doing from here, and then after this, we'll just move right into talking about development in the township and those examples that you gave me. But the next couple of things will be a steering committee. Now these are the workhorses who will be charged with reading each chapter of the plan as it's done. Ground truthing it, serving as technical reviewer, ensuring that the things that we have said are in fact true, realistic, doable, achievable, actually fit within the community. So we'll need a few folks for that, um, and we will need some kind of regular meeting schedule, and that can work however we would like it to for the steering committee. We can, um, we can get together, it can be before a planning commission meeting, it can be on a different day, we can do it remotely at certain times, just however that is going to work the best for you guys. So I don't think we need to make those decisions right now, but just so you know that that will be kind of the next step in the process. So I'm going to pause for a second and see if you have any questions about the master planning process and then we can go into talking about development. No? All right, good times. So um, the question was, what is what an example of premier development in Grand Blank Township? And then what is an example of not so premier development in Grand Blank Township? And so I've taken them in this order, starting with the premier development was Woodfield. This is fairly new and I actually had to go and Google it myself. I didn't know where that was. So I have a little dot on the map that's in the, the map is in the upper right hand corner. The dot on it is in the lower right hand corner of that map. And I just picked the clubhouse and that, that house in the middle was a real estate listing. And then the two in the bottom on each of these, I really tried to give some sense 
of, I just used the heck out of my Google Street View, but the idea was what kind of street presence do these developments project? They might be delightful once you get in them, but one thing that I wanted to know for all of them was what does it look like if you're not from here and you don't know what's back there? And in that case, um, I, there's not much, much glimpse of it from the outside, which is probably the desired outcome, right, of a, of a you know, private community like that. There wasn't even any Google Street View on the streets inside of it, it was all kind of like little closed up there, which is lovely once you're in it, but that, you know, there's two sides to that story. And I did say premier-ish out of respect to, I don't think anybody said, oh, this is an example of a premier development. Everybody was kind of like, mm, on the fence about it. So I want to talk about that too. And just so you know that that's why I said premier-ish, it wasn't my judgment. The next one um, was the Township Police Station in Grand Lake Schools. And uh, the police station, now that has great street presence. You can see that all the way down the road. <laughs> a relationship, it is, it is all there. The schools, however, um, and again, less so. For the same reasons, I think schools are meant to be a little in, in, insular. They are campuses, that's you know what they are. So from the street, you kind of can see the driveway, you can see the side of it. They are lovely buildings. I'm sure they're beautifully manicured. But to someone who is not a user, the experience is a little different than it is if you're right up in it. Genesis Health Park was another one. And I was really struck by kind of the commonality of this, the, the developments that were identified, at least the first several, that were identified as premier were lovely once you got in them, but you had to get in them. And the same is true with Genesis. It has those lovely trails. It has, you know, all kinds of really great things going into it. But from the side, you know, that bottom one is my entrance. So when I come in from Baldwin Road, it's just a sign. There's a identical sign there on Holly Road. I had to take the aerial view because from the street, I couldn't get both of the signs um, at the main entrance on Holly Road. And only in one spot do you see that there's a hospital in there. Big sign coming, right, Ed? There's a huge sign coming. <laughs> oh, right. variants. <laughs> <laughs> and then, finally, um, Holly Road from Trillium to Baldwin. And I have two slides about this, I took because it was kind of long, so I took it in two parts. So this is the kind of closer to Trillium part. You'll notice that those top two, they develop, they're, they're both uh, long orientations, and that's just what I had to do to kind of get them in there. And I, when I was cropping photos, that's when I noticed, boy, there's long, low, low buildings in this section here. But they're interesting buildings, and um, you can see that there was definitely painstaking landscaping in front of both the Trillium and the, um, that, I think that's a... What is that? That's an office of some kind there. And there's two actually right next to each other. You can see on the left hand side there's one peeking behind yeah, there. Yeah. They're lovely buildings. But again, a little bit set back from the road. Um, they don't quite have a relationship with the street so much as they do scenery. Yes? If I may, uh, yes? that's one of the ones that's probably been the most disappointing to me. Yeah. That development because it's never been finished. What? what it truly. It, truly. It was supposed to have had. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's got uh, uh, B dubs and let's see, it's, it's got uh, Bagger Daves. Bagger Daves, and I think that's about it. But there were supposed to be other buildings along the street that you can't really even really understand that it's there, but it is. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be more that internally focused as well. Internally focused, and then it would have a whole different kind of dynamic from from a street view uh, perspective. I believe. But it hasn't happened. Interesting, and is. So and are they selling outlots? Is that the thing? Say that again. Are they still selling outlots? Is that the thing? Or do you think it, like, may it still happen? It just hasn't yet? It hasn't or? happened for a decade. For a decade, yeah. That has been and there for a while. The yeah, the recession hit and things came to a screeching halt. And the property itself is, I think it's had a couple of different owners. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not sure why they haven't promoted that to finish it off. Yeah. Hmm. I did um, grab a screenshot of the Bagger Daves that's in front of it, um, which I thought was, which I, you know, I mean, that's perfectly proportional. I guess I was a little, like, it's still set pretty far back from the road. It's still got that whole kind of parking lot in front of it, and, um, and that's, that's definitely kind of a suburban configuration. And again, you know, kind of having that, that, that little bit of separation between the road, road and the development. 
And then the last one is just a car dealership. There were two along the stretch, so I picked it up as being a little bit representative. Moving further south um, on Holly Road, <clears throat> as we're getting kind of closer to the freeway, I thought that one on the top was really interesting. It's a lovely, I mean, when you drive by it, and I've driven by it a bunch of times, it's lovely. You mostly just kind of see the little sign in the tree, and the building, you know, is well kept and is well designed. But it does not relate to the road. I mean, it just, it's kind of, it doesn't face the road. It's got its side to the road. It, you know, is really kind of set far back, and you you either have to be looking at that sign or know what you want to to engage with it at all. The, the newer things, like the Taco Bell there, are built a little closer to the road. There's a Culver's that's right next to it that's kind of um, built a little closer also, but you can see that the, the drive through and an easement separates it. So the character here really <clears throat> continues to, to be suburban. I'm curious if, like, I really like the green space. I think that it offers... It, off, uh, it just, well, who doesn't like, you know, a tree? It offers sort of a softened environment that, you know, that is comfortable to me. Um, are you guys big on landscaping standards here? I haven't yeah. reviewed your zoning ordinance. Yeah. Yes. Yes, good, perfect, wonderful. And then the last, uh, the last picture there is just, um, is undeveloped. So I thought that it was very interesting to me that, you know, this section that was identified as some of the best development in the township was so green as to be undeveloped in spots, which I know that was a long stretch, but that just to me signals a comfort with greenery and a desire to have a little more of it and a little, you know, less of the emphasis on concrete and good development. That's what I have for slides on good development. Do you want any commentary on that? Well, adding to that, you know, where you were talking about the Taco Bell there, uh, we've, just, we've just finished, or the developer has just finished. A brand new Fairfield Inn that's back there, mm -hmm. and it, it, they haven't really got all of the landscaping in, but it's going to going to really be beautiful when it's done. The landscaping, the building is already open. But right. Winter decided to every year. <laughs> I think with Trillium, the original concept was that this would be a place you would go and park, and you could walk down the street. Lifestyle yeah. center, they call yes. them. Yes. Yeah. Well. Walk around and get everything you need. Yeah. Eat, you go to the theater, do a little shopping. It just never happened. And it was all interior focused with kind of like the back was facing towards Holly Road. That's, you're seeing kind of a yeah. uncompleted. So do you, so are they still building according to plan? Like if you went and looked at that site plan, could you see a path to success? There's been some changes from okay. the original plan. Sure. Because if somebody came in and wanted to do some developments like, well, what can we do to accommodate this? Mm -hmm. Not totally ignored, but I think if you go back and look at the original plan, there were water features and all kinds of things that you just haven't really realized. Sure. Another one of the most recent developments is the security credit union okay. complex there at the south, very south end of the township, okay. Saginaw and I-75. Gotcha. And they've made great use of some of the wetland areas, and they have uh, some very beautiful walking trails through there. Yeah. Um, really? And it's, it's beautiful. It's, it's, it's a beautiful where, site. That's where I go for my jobs, right there. It's all up and down, and it's beautiful. Cool. All right. There are two, uh, two buildings that have been completed. In fact, mm -hmm. if you are on either north or south on I-75, you should see both of the buildings because they are right along I-75. Okay. Very I'll easy to drive by. And well, very nicely done. Awesome. That's because of this planning commission. Yes. <laughs> of course it is. Go. All good development is because of planning commission. Peter, Peter <laughs> own chest will do this. So are you going to take credit for what we're about to see here next? Uh-oh. 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 That's why I have in my head. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, uh, less desirable development. You will see some consistency among these responses. Um, it started with Dort Highway north of Saginaw. So I just started on like the very north portion, and so this is Dort and Maple here. I'm working my way backwards. Um, in a couple of instances, the street view did not capture 
what was happening on the property and in those cases it was usually because the use was a huge land use and so that is what the issue is up there i 100 percent remember watching movies at that drive-in and going to the expo so <laughs> so this is what we have here now both pretty big land uses beforehand um here i don't see a whole lot of landscaping you know it seems like some of those could make a little could be a little more attractive i don't know how you make a bus yard much more attractive if it's not by adding landscaping you know so <clears throat> so that in, in certain instances, what I'm kind of trying to do here is to distinguish between um, what is just like an ugly use and what is a poorly designed good use. So I think that those are, you know, kind of really two different, two different problems that require two different tools to them. So there's the very, you know, northest section of Dort Highway. Moving a little further south, um, we have... <laughs> I was just saying, we have the Loch Lomond Golf Course. We love our golf courses here, and here we have one right up in the north end of town, right? No. no. Is that anymore? No. 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 Is it anything now? Three or four years. They reopened a bar, and that's... Uh, on just the bar property. itself? Okay. Um, the building for the Grand Blank Inn is there, that uh, auto repair shop on the other side, and then that kind of... Um, strip mall that's right across from the Grand Blank Inn are the examples that I have here. What I will say for them is that they're pretty close to the road. They're not, they don't have huge expansive parking lots in front of them, so at least you feel like you can see the building. And I, I don't think that they're terrible buildings myself. Um, they have some unique character. That top one could definitely mm, use a number of things. But all I'm saying is that in terms of terrible development, it's not great, but there's much worse. Moving a little further south, the next, the next unpremier area was Dort Highway north of Hill. So this is the little area, basically it's the point that, I've, um, that I'm showing here. There's that bank that's been there uh, forever, and we all know that there's a strip mall that's right behind it, which looks just like you would think a strip mall looks, nothing nothing no departures there basically and then in the bottom is kind of the um the view looking at the point if you're sitting there at the corner and it is you know it's pretty cluttered with a, a gas station and some sort of broken up not that attractive uses agreed and then finally the, the next response was Dort highway all the way to where grand lake city starts which is not you know right there exactly, but we took it about there. So what we find in that stretch is um, the car wash in the Wigville Party Store, both of them kind of in the same vein that we've been seeing. All of these developments that we've just pointed out have the same kind of character. They're a little small, they're a little set back. They have um, a few more residential features than commercial features, less flat top roofs, more um, gabled roofs, that kind of thing. And then in the bottom, uh, North of the city on Dort Highway is the Heritage Park development, which uh, I've also put a picture of next to it. That's from our files in, in our office, where we have been showing pictures of your Walmart to other communities <laughs> to say your Walmart can be better. Yeah. So I will say that for a Walmart, you've got about what there is to get in terms of good quality. <laughs> And then, um, sort of in the same vein, on Saginaw Street, again, we're heading north of the point. To be honest with you, once I got to looking at these developments, I thought they were pretty good, you know? Um, so those little businesses that are basically just past the point, including that tiny little strip mall, so that might be, I don't know, the most kind of user-friendly strip mall that I am all that aware of. The parking lot is small. It's directly in front of it. It, you know, it just has a few stores. The signage could be better, yes, absolutely. But it's got good windows. And again, the kind of like the scale and its placement on the road, I feel like are, are pretty good successes. The two that are right above it, um, and even kickers, do I have kickers on here? Is it, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> I think they're pretty cute and again it's got that sort of residential feel to it and a business look uh, with some you know care and attention and clean up and good signage it could be even cuter and then on the far corner there 
Now we have just a regulation old strip mall. Nothing cute about that one. And underneath it, the Wildwood Clinic. I know that's been there forever, ever, ever. I just picked it as an example of development that's been there forever, ever, ever. And then finally, um, Oh, no, we're still sagging on north of the point. So going a little further down, now we've passed Township Hall. And now, again, I have uh, the aerial view in the bottom right corner because this is mostly a function, again, of the large land uses. So the rink, the bowling alley, the cut stone company, and then there's one more past it. They all just have really big lots. For a, the things that you're driving past before you get to that cut stone building, not so pretty, but for a sort of industrial serving building, I think it looks pretty good. It certainly could be worse. And again, we have some green space. We have some landscaping to soften it up. Point being with all of these is that good bones, I think, you know, by carefully understanding what the limitations of uses are um, and applying some like cleanup and refreshing, I think that many of these properties, not all of them, if we're looking to change the character, we certainly can. But until that happens, I think that many of these properties really are are better than what a lot of communities have to work with. I will say that for sure. And then finally, the last area that was identified was the very northwest corner of the township, the Fenton and Maple intersection. And I just, you know, kind of took a, one, of, one shot of each of the corners. And then again, we have the, the overview there. All of those, I think, they just, if they were landscaped, they would be a perfectly fine use. It's a gas station. It's a little, it's at a party store or a convenience store there. Um, they look like bare bones buildings with a sea of asphalt in front of them because that's what they are, but that's not the same as deterioration, falling down, totally inappropriately located or anything like that. That is something that can be worked with. So I would say that from, it is my assessment that even here in the township, the things that could use improving, we don't have to start from you know absolute ground zero on them. And then this is just the last slide that I have, which is uh, a summary of those things, and I tossed them on a map for us. So premier-ish, um, largely concentrated in the south side. Now, mind you, I picked the two schools, so that was a little arbitrary, but other than that, all identified in the south side. And the unpremier, pretty closely um, concentrated right around this little point area here. The things that you see while you're driving to work every day, <laughs> some of you. And then... That's all that I have for you this evening. I would be delighted to answer any more questions or tell you anything you would like to know. Well, I, I would want to point out that uh, with regards to the uh, unpremier <coughs> communities, we may not always agree on everything, um, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, in any event, you know, we do have a lot of work to do and we've done a lot in, in working with uh, Leah and the folks at BRI uh, so far has been great and I expect we're going to have to roll our sleeves up here in this next week or so and get some of these you know survey drafts and other things done. Some of the keys that I'm going to need to and want to work on is the idea of the steering committee and I know we don't have to form all that tonight but the thoughts on my mind with regards to the steering committee wouldn't vary too far away from what we did um, with regards to the review committee. That would be for Al and Dan and myself, and then maybe Mr. Laddie, if he's uh, interested, to, to be that, uh, that steering committee to do those initial reviews of the uh, draft documents when they're prepared, provide you with those initial comments, and then be able to help explain that to the, to the rest of the planning commission when the time comes. So that's my thinking, and that hasn't been put in stone, and, and we can still do some follow-up, but uh, if, if folks are generally agreeable, or if you, if you, we could have this entire commission be the steering committee. It just gets to be a little bit more difficult to, to manage, and then everybody potentially has to take more time and other things. So the idea would be, mine, is to have that group do this. Say that if anybody's got an interest, we don't want to squash that at all. Not at all. If anybody wants to volunteer, go ahead. Sure. Doesn't have to be tonight. <laughs> Doesn't have to be tonight. We can do some follow-up. <laughs> sure. I would say this, if I could. I would say to, to, to Jay and Gassan, um, being newer, um, wow, what a, if you're interested in master planning, being yeah. at that level, um, I mean, it's going to be, you know, some work, and it might 
feel like it's a little bit over your head, but it's probably a pretty good way to really get into things. If David's over here shaking and said no. Um. No, no, I, I, I'm here to do whatever you want me to do. I know, I appreciate that. This place. <laughs> but, but that thought, and we can follow up on that, and we will, but uh, I would say by the time we get to this next meeting, by all means, we want to have that and a few of these other things buttoned down pretty good. So I will follow up on that, sir. I wanted to add something on the um, on the less desirable communities. Yeah. Um, I spoke up a lot about the good things in Grand Blanc, but um, in recent developments, um, the preserve of Grand Blanc on Baldwin Road, okay. uh, detached condos that are this far apart, mm -hmm. and, um, uh, only a mile from Woodfield. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, that's that's a development that happened in the last 20 years that I personally would not like to see duplicated. Is that because because of something about the way that it looks or because of what it is? Do you think condos that are both? Closed? Okay. Both. Um, there's small lots, short driveways, uh, narrow roads, lots of on-street parking, although it's, de it's denied in their uh, association rules. No. Um, but there's tons of on-street parking, no sidewalks. Uh, it's a very depressing. It, it reminds me of driving in the Flint. Hmm. Uh, but it's a newer development. Um, but the, an old development that's been happening in Grand Blanc since I can remember, and I moved here in 1963, mm -hmm. is uh, the circulation which you mentioned on one of your slides. Yeah. And we have three roads that transverse the township east and west and three that transverse north and south. And um, otherwise, lots of traffic is making left-hand turns or turning onto other streets to get to the other street. And um, if we're going to see a build-out of our community, mm -hmm. which is probably going to be double or triple the population that we have now, mm -hmm. we better prepare for a, a circulation improvement plan that will uh, eliminate and connect some of those corridors. Okay. So are you thinking, just you know, sort of off the top of your head, that a more gridded network is what is needed? More gridded. Okay. Um, so Genesee through to uh, Perry Road would be a primary one. Certainly the Dort Highway extension is going to be a big improvement, right. but there's a lot of other improvements both in the township and um, and in the city, uh, which is the north-south corridor, Saginaw Street. Right. Um, it's a narrow road, but Perry and Grand Blanc Road don't meet up, and right. it creates lots of hazards. And personally, I can see where... <coughs> Uh, Perry Road may be able to be connected through along Bush Street and Jewett Trail and across the tracks to Grand Blank Road. And I think that that would be, but that's the top, that's the city, it's not us. Right. Um, so cooperation with the city and their master plan, um, but I think that that connection would alleviate lots of the traffic problems that discourage businesses both in the city and the township, north and south of the city. Sure. Well, I, I really appreciate your point about ensuring that our circulation systems can handle the increase as well as our housing systems and our utilities. That's, that's awesome. Cool. There's just a, a comment about what the growth might be. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody mentioned the new hotel mm -hmm. that's going up on High Road. You know, that company, the owner, and it's a franchise, sees something that, that you know, they caused them to put in another hotel, mm -hmm. large hotel, and not too long ago it was Holiday Inn, which is down there off Holly Road there as well. And then, uh, the subdivisions. Now, Mr. Brown mentioned about the rentals mm -hmm. going up, but uh, the announcement here just this week about uh, the Chevrolet assembly plant is going to add a thousand workers, 
Those people are going to come. They're going to want to probably rent, not buy, because they don't know how long yes. that, you know, that the sales of trucks are going to be great and yep. maintained. So, uh, you know, that there is a good area for rental will be, but uh, what what does that development? What data do they have? or what data did they use mm -hmm. to project the fact that we want to spend X amount of dollars to put this in and uh, you know go from there. So some of the local areas that are that are under development, discussion with some of those people to try to pick their brain a little bit on what what was the data that they used to cause them to put in a large in investment. Sure. I, I would like like that idea a lot. Yeah. Do you have any friends that would share their awesome data with us? Because I feel like that's going to have to be, you know, kind of like a connection made. I don't know if we're going to get that good data from a cold call. We'll start with the survey and try, but... Well, to uh, support what Mr. Bandersky says, you know, the hotels and whatever other kinds of development we've seen recently is spot on. Fairfield Inns do not build four-story huge ends just because they think maybe somebody might want to stop there. True. They do their due diligence, they know what they're talking about, and they don't generally make mistakes in building something like that. Right. There's an area of growth that I'm not sure it's so good because we talk about trying to get younger people in, and that's in my comments I put in that we used to be a uh, bedroom community. Uh -huh. Now we're an assisted living community because we've got so many of those going on in, you know, in the area. They're, they're all over. And so we're, somebody's planning, when I say somebody, the developers are planning for a lot of old people yes. in this should. area. In all areas. It is not just you. It is every community that I'm in is looking for senior housing. We got a lot. <laughs> so, and we're probably look no more. more. Yeah, we're probably going to get more. Yep. Any other questions from Planning Commission? I just make a just make a comment here. Uh, we talked about the steering committee, uh, so that's a, a way, obviously, that the Planning Commission is going to be involved. But you know, in order to support this, and you brought this up in your uh, pitch, uh, that we're going to need as. Um, you know, as a planning commission, as a board, as a Grand Blank Township Board of Trustees, Grand Blank Township staff members are all going to need to uh, act as uh, ways to get information into the study, be able to conduit into that. So part of the assignment that comes out of there is um, that we all ought to be expecting to, to provide input uh, from ourselves, from our family and friends, uh, business associates and others. So that's a part of our, our assignment as we go through this. Pick up, a, pick up a party box. Right? Yeah, it's something like that. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to do some demonstration on the appropriate way to use the party box. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but it is a, it's a good idea, and it's a great way to, to get some of this stuff done. And, and thank you for raising that point. Uh, I think you're right. We're, I'm hopeful that a lot of folks will take that upon themselves and do some of these um, you know, directed um, meetings with folks, folks you know, people in your neighborhoods and stuff, that that has great potential. And so, you know, I just want to emphasize uh, the emphasis that we put on this, this input, the, the data collection, the information, the surveys. That is really going to drive this and it's going to be the, the, the mechanism that we use to, to create this plan. And the fact that everybody's so interested and in, in the firm we've chosen is so capable of, of doing this kind of work, I have a huge excitement level, and one of them is because it's been a while since I've done a master plan, to be honest with you, as far as utilizing the, um, you know, the technologies that are available. The last time I went through this, the technologies weren't what they are today. The number of people utilizing this technology and the availability wasn't there. So my expectations are pretty high and hopeful with regards to the volume and uh, the type of input that we get from folks. That is going to be... Um, you know, paramount to putting together this great plan that we're going to be working on. And I'm excited about seeing what kind of data we get. So, yeah, I think we're on the right track with this. Mr. Johnson? One of the things that I wanted to bring up was um, we talked a lot about the younger generation, millennial generation. 
and uh, I, I put my hands on a study. I'll have to go back and see if I can find it. But one of the things that it mentioned was that the millennial generation isn't necessarily all for rental. Right. Um, they, they do want to buy. I mean, these are the kids that watch their parents lose a house or lost, watch their friend's parents lose a house. I yep. mean, somebody knows somebody that went through foreclosure. <clears throat> So they're, they're, they're just behind. Yes. Like they're not doing what I did at 20, they're doing at 35. Yes. So I, I don't want to get too far into the rental side of things without looking at the fact that maybe we're just seeing this delay. The rental is the short side. <clears throat> we need to look at also, you know, and I don't know if that's something that you guys can forecast with your studies or not. But. No, I mean, I really, as I said, think at least for me, and I read these studies whenever I get my hands on them too, um, I'm waiting to see how this plays out. You know, we can forecast data, I don't know. The thing, one thing that I just will never forget from my statistics class was like, you know, given all the ways that we have to like forecast what might be in the future, sort of the least reliable is looking at what has just happened and drawing the line forward. all of that forecasting with a grain of salt and kind of work with the, the pillars that we have, the things that have not changed on and coupling those like big, long-standing things with what is the opportunity right now, like what is the best fit with this zipper as we go along. So I would be really leery of telling you with any kind of certainty what the housing market is going to be. But I could probably come in a way. Just question for you. Did you get what you were expecting? Today? Oh, I did not hear. Tonight, did I hear what I was expecting? Yes. Or do you think we're picking up on any of the other when she talks? No. Um, then the only way that we would be able to do that would be to have you come forward. Or do you want to? You can sit here and I'll sit there. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, no, that's fine. Sure. Um, no, I'm just asking a question. Did you hear what you wanted to hear from the point about? I certainly heard what I wanted to hear, which was a good discussion for you know what you're looking for in this process and in your community and to sort of gain your your local expertise. Um, I try hard not to have any expectations this early in the process because what fun would that be, <laughs> right? I'm here to learn with you. So I very much appreciated, I will say that for sure, I very much appreciated your candor and your sort of like thoughtfulness in this process. It's, Mark was right, it's gonna be great to work with you guys. <laughs> okay. Someplace along the line, you need to uh, pick Paul Schultz's brain, who's That's always true. taken uh, Notes and does a recording, a reporting. Oh, but so you know also, everything. She's <laughs> also doing reporting in a lot of other areas, so she spends a lot of time listening to a lot of people, right? And so she may have some good ideas. I bet. It's true. Let's set up a meeting. Let's do that. That sounds perfect. <laughs> so, pick her brain. Absolutely. Okay, I think we'll move on in our agenda. Then. Next item on our agenda is new business. I don't think we have any new business for this evening. We're going to move on to committee reports, Mr. Manson. Um, nothing more than just the, uh, you know, about the being ambassadors for this plan. Uh, everyone who's going to come in touch with it is going to need to help that way. Thank you. Mr. Lloyd, do you have anything else from the planning and zoning standpoint? I do. I just want to point out uh, um, Dolores and I have gotten ourselves pretty close to final draft on the um, solar ordinance and that's been transmitted over to Mr. Brown who's taking a look at that on our behalf and then once he's done we'd like to get it over to Mr. Laddie have him take a look just make sure from a legal standpoint we're good and then we'd like to bring it before the Planning Commission for your review and consideration maybe at March and if you're generally good to go we would set a public hearing and consider adopting it so we're, we're well on our way and in that process uh, it's gone pretty well, and I can't say thanks enough to Dolores for her 
Great work on that. Thank you. Mr. Brown, Zoning Board of Appeals. We've not had anything, Mr. Chairman. And again, you actually touched on it. Uh, Genesis was our most recent one, and that was back in December, where we approved the uh, additional signage on the front of the medical center itself. That's it. Site plan review. We've seen one site plan in the last month, and that was for a parking lot. Um, Dort Federal Credit Union, uh, I guess hard to describe. It's next, uh, the parking lot is kind of filling a space between Holly Road oh, and Culver's it's a, and... It's Regency, uh, they, oh, what's the name of that road? Yeah, just on the south side of, of all of that. It's kind of like the, the service drive that ties and runs up to the Taco Bell that you mentioned. Um, they discovered they needed more parking, especially... Um, when they had a lot of different groups, a lot of training going on, and so they're adding about 40, 48, 40, I think it was. They, lo they lost a few, so yep. it was like a net 45 yeah, added parking spaces there, but they had to get creative because there's quite a slope in there and a lot of little different pieces. But we uh, reviewed that, gave comments, and then I don't know, they were supposed to come back for administrative review. I don't know where, what the status is. Yeah, they is. submitted all of the requirements. It's gone through um, engineering, and uh, their their construction plans are being looked at now. That is it. Next item on our agenda is a motion for adjournment. Mr. Chairman, Mr. I Bandersky. make a motion that we adjourn. Mr. Bandersky's made a motion for adjournment at 8.37 p.m. Is there support for that motion? Yes. 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 Mr. Yacho supports yeah, that. You know, All those in favor, so. signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? We're adjourned. Thank you.